17-year-old Danny Goldman was on the precipice of adulthood. He had a girlfriend, was set to graduate high school, and was making plans for his 18th birthday. Unfortunately, he wouldn't get the chance to celebrate. On March 28th, the day before Danny's birthday, an unidentified man entered the Goldman family home in Surfside, Florida, and demanded a large sum of money. When the man discovered that the money wasn't present in the home, he abducted Danny at gunpoint to exchange for ransom. The assailant told the Goldmans he'd call that night to make arrangements, but bizarrely, they never heard from the man or their son again. Over the course of the next 50 years, the case would grow cold until a group of locals and the former mayor of Surfside came together and made a shocking discovery. Danny's case may not have been solved not so much due to a lack of information, but perhaps corrupt investigators. 50-year-old court documents, indictments, and the word of informants pointed towards a massive cover-up which may have involved not only the man who abducted Danny, but connections to the mafia under Santo Traficante, sheriff's deputies on the take, and even the family of Danny's girlfriend. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 76, The Abduction of Danny Goldman. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the 1966 abduction of 17-year-old Danny Goldman. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances, examining a different case each Monday. If you have questions, comments, or case suggestions, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at traceevpod on Instagram at Trace Evidence Pod, or join the Facebook discussion group simply by searching for Trace Evidence. You can visit the website at trace-evidence.com for full episodes, social media links, merchandise, and much more. Trace Evidence is also on Patreon, so if you would like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash traceevidence, where you can get rewards such as stickers, pins, and commercial-free episodes. There's also a PayPal donation link on the website for those of you who don't wish to go through Patreon. This show is a complete one-man operation, and your support is greatly appreciated. Today we examine the abduction of Danny Goldman, a 53-year-old case of abduction, extortion, and corruption. This is Episode 76, The Abduction of Danny Goldman. Daniel Jess Goldman was born on March 29, 1948, to parents Aaron and Sally Goldman. Danny, as he was most commonly referred to by friends and family, was raised in Surfside, Florida, located in Southern Florida in Miami-Dade County. Surfside is a small town covering 0.56 square miles, with a population of less than 6,000 residents today, though in the 1960s, that number was just over 3,000. It wasn't exactly easy for the Goldman family, with Sally having experienced two miscarriages prior to Danny's birth, and Danny himself having been born dangerously premature, weighing only two pounds, six ounces. It was with joy and excitement that the Goldmans welcomed their baby boy into their lives. Danny's father, Aaron, was a successful contractor and construction business owner while his mother Sally was an interior designer and the daughter of Harry and Jeanette Gudkowski, who had come to Florida some years earlier and established a kosher hotel and restaurant in Miami Beach with several business partners from New York. The Nemo Hotel, built in 1921, was the first in Miami Beach to specifically target kosher Jewish guests. At the time, hotels in southern Florida had a rule of serving a restricted clientele, which essentially translated to Gentiles only, no Jewish guests. The anti-Semitism of the time was hardly confined to South Beach, though it wouldn't be until five years after World War II in 1949 
when the Florida State Legislature would pass a law ending the discriminatory practices in terms of real estate and hotels. The construction of the Nemo played a role in beginning to turn that tide, and in many ways, changed the face of Southern Florida. Soon, others followed suit, most notably the Seabreeze Hotel. Suffice it to say, Danny's family had established themselves in the area and there was wealth on both sides. The young man grew up in a beautiful home in the 1100 block of 88th Street, and there was little, if anything, Danny wanted and didn't have. Despite his family's wealth and his ease of access to items of interest, Danny was said to have been extremely kind, caring, and polite. Not a great deal is known about Danny's early life, though he was raised by his parents in Surfside and seemed to develop into an intelligent and focused young man. He had hobbies as most kids do, enjoyed reading and playing outside, getting dirty and running home as the sun went down. A neighbor, when later asked, described Danny as a boy who had everything but, quote, not spoiled, just a very sweet, good boy. He'd do anything for you, end quote. We do know that Danny was raised in the Jewish religion. While his parents never claimed to have been overly religious, they did take their beliefs seriously, seriously enough that when Danny came of age, they all went to Israel for his bar mitzvah. Israel itself became a country the same year Danny was born, and so it was a dual celebration of both Danny and the country itself reaching adulthood in the eyes of the religion. While Danny followed tradition, fasting for Yom Kippur and avoiding the consumption of pork, he wasn't a zealot by any means. Aaron described his son's religious views best, stating, quote, He took religious life like most teenagers, without getting excited over it. End quote. As a teen, Danny developed a reputation as being both a driven young man and a helpful one. As Danny entered his late teens, it was the mid-1960s, and America was in the midst of a cultural revolution. And while Danny may have enjoyed spinning Beatles and Rolling Stones albums, he wasn't exactly a member of the counterculture. While humorous in retrospect, one neighbor of the family's was quite serious in stating to a local newspaper that Danny was, quote, a nice, polite boy, not one of those long-haired beetle types you see around. End quote. This seemed to be the general consensus of Danny, the kind of teenager whose friends and neighbors all acknowledged was a courteous young man who would go out of his way to offer a helping hand, regardless of hair length. Danny was drawn to electronics. In fact, he thoroughly enjoyed working on them, even when it wasn't to help someone else out. Regardless of his prosperous home life, Danny had a drive to strike out on his own and wanted to make his own money, and it was by way of his understanding of electronics that he was able to earn some pocket change. He could commonly be found working on televisions, fixing them for neighbors, or just studying them to better understand the function of their circuitry. Beyond fixing things, Danny was also a ham radio enthusiast. Ham radio was essentially amateur radio in which users could transmit on non-commercial channels, an internet, in a sense, of the 19th and 20th centuries, perhaps more related to the more specific idea of a podcast than that of a general internet itself. Danny had a two-way radio installed in his broad, boxy car, a white rambler, registered in his father's name, as well as there having been a 40-foot radio tower jutting out from the roof of the family home. Regardless, Danny appeared to have an innate skill when it came to the use, repair, and construction of electronic devices. Danny was smart, though he wasn't exactly pulling in straight A's. He attended Miami Beach High School, and his principal at the time described him as average in both grades and behavior. Friends of the time described Danny as shy, saying that while he could be hilarious and fun, social situations made him somewhat withdrawn, and in school he was fairly quiet. Danny kept to himself, mostly, not participating in any extracurricular activities, and reportedly blended in with the others, not doing much to draw attention or call himself out from any of the other 2,000 students. Though Danny did stand out in at least one way, the dark-haired and dark-eyed young man sprung up to stand 5 feet 11 inches tall, and while he may not have been the most charismatic, he certainly didn't go without notice. Sharon Lloyd definitely noticed Danny, and the two began dating. Their romance wasn't very different from that of a modern-day high school relationship, 
The two were nearly always together, and during times that they weren't, they could frequently be found chatting on the phone with one another. Danny even went so far as to create a device which, when applied to the other phone in the house, would indicate to him through a sound that someone had picked up the other line and might be listening in. Danny was getting excited. Now a senior in high school with a lovely young woman by his side, he had dreams of a bigger, brighter future. It was March of 1966 and Danny would turn 18 on Tuesday the 29th. He had a lot to consider before then, specifically what his plans would be following his completion of high school. One thing was for certain, with the Vietnam War raging, Danny was set to accompany his mother to a local selective service office to register for the draft as then, and still now, was legally required for men upon reaching the age of 18. The draft changed one year earlier though. College undergraduate and graduate students who were signed up for the draft would previously have received an automatic designation as S2, meaning they would be granted a deferment for post-secondary education and could not be forced to serve in the military. Lyndon Johnson, president at the time, was struggling with diminishing enlistments and a much higher demand for soldiers, seeking 27,400 men in September and then 33,600 in October of 1965. Johnson worked with others to establish a new policy, which would allow college students to be entered into the draft with deferment preference being granted only to those students who maintained a high GPA. This, of course, received a massive backlash from the college communities, many of whom were already protesting against the war, and now things would really kick into high gear. Of course, for Danny, his parents expected the young man to attend university. He'd already applied for admission to Dade Junior College, but most people expected him to just step into the family's construction business anyway. Danny was by no means a highly ranked student, but it was likely believed that between being enrolled in college and his family's wealth, he likely wouldn't have been drafted. While all that may have been a part of the plan, with college functioning as a safe way out, it would never come to pass. In fact, Danny's 18th birthday wouldn't come along the way everyone had hoped. Rather than birthday cake and streamers, the family would be inundated with police officers, reporters, neighbors, and everyone who wanted to offer a hand or just sneak a glimpse of the family, in the aftermath of what can only be described as an incredibly bizarre crime. Sometime between 4.30 and 5 a.m. on Monday, March 28th, an unknown individual gained access to the Goldman home via a sliding glass door which had been left unlocked. Upon entry to the home, both Aaron and Sally were awakened by what they described as an overweight male brandishing a handgun. According to the Goldmans, they weren't able to identify the gun-wielding man, though they did describe him as being in his 50s, standing approximately 5 feet 8 inches tall, and weighing between 180 and 200 pounds. The assailant wore a baseball cap and large silver-rimmed sunglasses, making it difficult to view much beyond the lower half of his face. Reportedly, this man addressed the Goldmans by their first names, Aaron and Sally, and demanded to be given a sum of $10,000, which he believed to be concealed somewhere in the home. $10,000 in 1966 is the equivalent of approximately $78,000 today. While the Goldmans explained to the man that they had no such money stashed in the home, the assailant disagreed and told them that they knew what he was there for. When the family failed to provide a location, he made the choice to tie them up so he could look on his own. Strangely, the man did not ransack the house or make a mess. His search was later described as gentle. Aaron offered to write the man a check for $10,000 on the spot, but the suspect scoffed at the idea. Utilizing the pull cord from Venetian blinds, the man made them sit on the floor and then bound their wrists together, but before securing the knots, he inserted knives and a pair of scissors between the cord and their skin, informing them that were they to struggle and try to free themselves, they would undoubtedly cut their wrists and could even die as a result. He then placed tape over their mouths to silence them. At this time, the assailant then began looking through the home for cash, though ultimately the only money he found was in Aaron's wallet, and it was far from the $10,000 he had originally requested. Frustrated with the lack of money, 
The gunman then entered Danny's bedroom. He woke the 17-year-old and ordered him to get dressed, which Danny did. Emerging from the bedroom, the gunman stood behind Danny with his weapon trained on him. He bound Danny's wrists. Danny towered over his stocky assailant. Aaron later claimed to have told Danny to cooperate with the man, though this may suggest confusion with the timeline as he could not have done so after his mouth had been covered by tape, so it's possible that Danny was awakened prior to the application of the tape. Either way, the gunman informed the Goldmans that he'd originally wanted $10,000, but since they'd made it so difficult on him, he was going to take Danny with him, and if they wanted to get their son back, they'd now have to pay $25,000, approximately $194,000 in today's value. The gunman informed the Goldmans that he would call to make arrangements for the ransom, that they'd better answer the call, and that if he didn't have his money by 6 p.m. that evening, then his demand would rise to $50,000, equivalent today to $387,510. At this time, the gunman walked out of the home with Danny. The two entered Danny's white rambler and drove off. Aaron, somehow, had managed to get back to his feet quickly and was able to watch through the window as the abductor drove off with his son. It was at this time that Aaron began shouting as loudly as he could, trying to get the attention of his neighbors. The first witness to hear Aaron's cries reported hearing them at 5.20 a.m. Emil Miles, who lived directly across the street, explained to the Miami Herald, quote, We heard him screaming, please help me, get the police, help me. We heard someone running down the street. My wife, Juliet, wouldn't let me go outside, said it was too dangerous, end quote. Another neighbor, Walter Schweitzer, was also alarmed by the screams and sent his 18-year-old son, Phil, over to the Goldman home to find out what was going on. When Phil entered the Goldman home, he found Aaron and Sally still bound. Carefully, he was able to undo the bindings without cutting them, at which time he ran the short distance back home and told his parents to call the police. Phil's mother noted to the Miami Herald that the Goldmans owned a dog who barked at almost everything even cars driving several blocks away, but on this night, during which the abduction had occurred, they hadn't heard a sound from the dog. The first responding officers were deputies of the Dade County Sheriff's Department, today known as the Miami-Dade County Sheriff's Department. According to initial reports, beyond knowing their first names, Aaron reported that the assailant behaved and spoke to them as though he knew them personally. The first response of investigators was to try and locate Danny's car, hoping it would lead them to the abductor. Captain Richard Shelton later stated, quote, We have everything on wheels, water, and in the air looking for the car. We're broadcasting bulletins statewide every 15 to 20 minutes. End quote. While investigators were trying to piece together exactly what happened, Aaron spoke to the media, explaining that while the police were involved, quote, we have asked the authorities and they have agreed to leave us entirely alone in negotiating with the real kidnapper." End quote. Some four hours after Danny had been taken, a legal secretary spotted what she believed to be his missing rambler. The woman, identified only as Mrs. Robert Goodman, a true sign of 1960s reporting, stated that she parked beside the car at approximately 9.30 a.m. and, quote, there was this white four-door rambler parked at the curb. It had a Bahamas license plate on the front. I'd heard about the kidnapping, so when I got to the office, I called the Miami Beach police." End quote. Unfortunately, the police weren't exactly receptive. Mrs. Goodman reported the license plate number, and the police replied that it didn't match the number they had on record. They asked her what year model the car appeared to be, but Mrs. Goodman didn't know for sure. At that time, the Miami Beach police told her then it must not be the same car they were looking for. Nearly seven hours later, at 4 p.m., Harvey Farr, Danny's cousin, happened upon the white four-door Rambler in the very spot that Mrs. Goodman had seen it in earlier. Familiar with the car, Farr contacted police and within minutes they were on the scene located just one mile south from the Goldman home at 71st Street and Harding Avenue. Inside of an hour, more than 25 police officers were there examining the car, questioning locals, and gathering information. A team from the crime lab arrived to dust the car for prints, 
They noted no indication of blood inside the vehicle, which at the time was considered a good sign. Unfortunately, due to technological limits of the times, there were no checks for fibers, DNA, or any kind of trace evidence. At some point during the examination, the media arrived. Multiple reporters had been camping out on the front lawn of the Goldman home throughout the day and would continue to do so throughout the night, and some were excited with the change of scenery and the possibility of a new lead. It was a reporter who first asked authorities if they'd gained access to the trunk yet, at which time an officer was dispatched to the Goldman home to acquire the spare keys. The trunk, however, was found to be empty. As the day progressed, news coverage increased. Many of the reporters discussed the details in vague terms, and most of them sounded like this. The waiting continues, and so does the speculation about Danny's condition, about the kidnappers' motives, and about what police are doing in the case. For the Goldmans, though, while the abductor had drawn their anger, the media was quickly rising up the ranks of those whom they despised. According to Aaron, in an interview months later, the constant coverage and speculation by the media only worked to complicate the situation. Cameras rolled, showing police swarming over the property, phone lines being adjusted, and as far as Aaron was concerned, the extent of the coverage opened them up to a great deal of contact they didn't want. At the time, there was only one call they awaited, and that was the abductor. But due to the coverage, they began receiving calls from all around the country. While many of the callers wanted to wish the family well, jamming up the lines wasn't helping the process. As the 6 p.m. deadline drew closer, there was a buzz in the air and an urgency. From the police to the Goldmans to the media, everyone waited with bated breath for the call. They wondered what the ransom situation would be, where the exchange would be made, and whether or not the Goldmans would get to speak to their son to verify his safety. All of this, however, sunk like a lead balloon when 6 p.m. came and went. So did 7 p.m., 8 p.m., 9 p.m., and so on. While the Goldman's phone rang, it was never the abductor. In fact, the Goldman family not only were never contacted by the man who abducted their son, but they never spoke to their son again either. No one did, for Danny Goldman disappeared into that misty Florida morning and never returned. No one could understand it. Why abduct a 17-year-old for ransom if no ransom was going to be demanded? It simply didn't make sense, and it certainly didn't bode well for Danny's safety. Despite his frustrations with the media, Aaron agreed to appear on television in hopes of drawing the attention of the abductor and finding a way to get Danny back. Here's a short clip of Aaron making a public statement. In the words of the kidnapper, all he wants is money, and all we want is our son safely returned. Aaron wasn't the only one to make a plea, with news anchors, police, and friends of the family speaking out in hopes of gathering enough money to bring Danny home safely. We've already collected in excess of $5,000. In excess of $10,000. Donated about $15,000. We have $25,000 in bills waiting to be delivered to you. Despite these efforts, Danny's abductors did not contact the police, the family, or anyone else. No one saw Danny, and while the family was utterly shattered, having lost two children before Danny and now Danny himself, they didn't know what to do. Danny's then-girlfriend, Sharon Lloyd, took to standing outside of their home, speaking to the media, and showing pictures of herself and Danny together. She spoke lovingly of Danny and asked for anyone to help find him, at Miami Beach High School, public announcements were made regarding Danny's abduction, and any student who may have had information was urged to report it immediately. But nothing came, at least nothing solid. Authorities received some tips, some leads which they tracked down, but it never led anywhere. The circumstances of Danny's abduction were just as bizarre as the suspect's apparent change of mind when it came to wanting ransom. The question really was, if the assailant no longer wanted money, what would he have done with Danny? Aaron soon began to turn his anger towards investigators, feeling that they were playing political games. He felt authorities were hesitant to tell the press to back off because they didn't want to appear as the bad guys in the situation. But Aaron felt their behavior was only hindering the process, stating, quote, With all that hue and cry, 
No kidnapper is going to risk contact. We were beat from the start. End quote. The FBI eventually became involved with the case, and while by that time, Aaron wasn't exactly thrilled with the way local law enforcement handled things, he was pleasantly surprised by the behavior of federal investigators, saying, quote, It was the FBI that moved in with us and made a real effort to get the facts. Their agents were not interested in dramatic results or excuses for failure. They got to know us and to know Danny. End quote. While a rumor had begun circulating that the Goldmans had been socking away cash to give to Danny in an effort to fly him out of the country to avoid the draft, and perhaps this was the money the kidnappers sought, it was the FBI who began looking in a different direction. They began to wonder if all this might have something to do with contact Aaron had made with federal authorities in the weeks leading up to the kidnapping. Aaron was a prominent figure in South Florida. While wealthy from his businesses and married to the daughter of wealthy entrepreneurs from the North, Aaron served a role in multiple areas of the community. One particular role of prominence saw him sitting on the board of directors for a local bank, the Five Points Bank. Aaron had previously been on the board of directors for the Miami National Bank. He had left the National Bank when he'd allegedly discovered illegal activities being conducted by other members of the board and officers of the bank itself. It will be Aaron's connection to these financial institutions that will reveal a long series of events and individuals which were never properly investigated. According to multiple reports, Aaron had cooperated with federal investigators as they were looking into money laundering, fraudulent loans, and a number of other illegal activities being run through the Five Points Bank. The case slowly evolved into a racketeering and conspiracy investigation which pointed towards local officials and mafia gangsters, including Meyer Lansky and Santo Traficante, one of the most powerful mob bosses in the history of the mafia. Traficante controlled Florida and Cuba, and using banks to launder money, initiated quite a money-making scheme, and this was not the first time it had been done in the area. In fact, all of the evidence was presented to a federal grand jury on Thursday, March 24th, just four days before Danny was abducted on Monday the 28th. Ultimately, 19 indictments came thundering down, but for the most part, these seemed to target lower-tier criminals, while those who had been involved, but at the highest levels, were completely ignored. For many, it appeared that sacrifices had been made, a financial hit was taken, and this certainly adds up to quite the motive for many to want to hurt Aaron Goldman and his family. So what happened? Nothing. Investigators never tied anyone to the case. Charges were never filed. No one was ever even listed as an official suspect. As time slowly began passing, the Goldmans fought to keep the case alive, but law enforcement began moving away from it. Typically, in situations such as this, when a case begins growing cold, investigators are outspoken about the fact that they're still working the case and seeking information that they still have hope to find answers. That didn't really happen here, in fact, quite the opposite. Law enforcement grew quiet rapidly, and at some point, the case was officially listed in the system as administratively closed. For the next 46 years, the case would remain, for the most part, untouched. Aaron Goldman passed away in 2010, followed just two years later by his wife Sally in 2012. Both parents went to the grave never knowing what became of Danny, and it was Sally's last wish for the case to be solved. While law enforcement may not have been interested, others were. A group of five individuals, three of whom knew Danny personally, all of whom were residents of Surfside, took it upon themselves to try and honor Sally's last wish by digging into the case. Paul Novak is an attorney and the former mayor of Surfside, at the time of Danny's abduction, Novak was eight years old, and he remembers the chaos and fear that swept through the community. Novak was able to uncover thousands of documents related to the investigation and other criminal activities at the time, which he believes paints a disturbing portrait of mafia influences, murder, and police corruption. While it remains to be proven, Novak uncovered enough that the Miami-Dade Sheriff's Department reopened the investigation in 2012. 
The investigation began with two known low-level burglars operating under the blanket of the Traficante Crime Organization in the 1960s. These two men were George Defias and Joe Cacciatore, and they fit the general description of the man who abducted Danny and were known to be in the area at the time the abduction took place. In fact, Cacciatore was Traficante's cousin. It was this group of volunteer investigators who actually pushed for evidence to be re-examined, including a fingerprint taken from the sliding glass door the morning Danny was taken. That print, once run through the system, got a match. George Defias. This seems to indicate quite clearly that Defias was present in the home that day and was the man who took Danny. But how does Cacciatore come into play? Quite simply, Cacciatore had an apartment located just two and a half blocks away from where Danny's car was later found. Many believe that Danny was taken from his car to that apartment. Over the years, there have been a lot of rumors about what may have ultimately been Danny's fate, but several of these stories told by informants, prisoners, and associates of Cacciatore and Defias agree on many of the details. According to interviews with potential informants, the tragic story seemed to suggest that Danny had been abducted and taken to Cacciatore's apartment. The plan, initially, was to hold Danny for ransom and to return him after the receipt of payment. But everything went sideways when Danny recognized one of the assailants or their associates. According to statements made by Robert Landry, a Florida prison inmate who spoke with the sheriff's deputy in 1968, Cacciatore and Defias became worried that they'd be caught, and the decision was made to kill Danny. Following his murder, rumors suggest that Danny was dismembered, taken aboard a boat, and disposed of in the Florida Gulf Stream. But wait a second. If all this information was floating around out there, even in 1968, why wasn't anything done about it? This is where the list of names associated with this crime becomes truly fascinating. Just seven months after Danny's abduction, in October of 1966, five deputies of the Dade County Sheriff's Department were indicted on burglary and larceny charges. This indictment included two key figures, Major Manson Hill, then Chief of Detectives, and Sergeant David Hellman, head of the Sheriff's Intelligence Division. Dade County Sheriff Talmadge A. Buchanan was later named in separate indictments for perjury and conspiracy to commit bribery. Both Manson Hill and David Hellman were directly involved with the investigation and also appeared at the home on the morning Danny was abducted. Several officers working at the time later explained it was highly unusual for two high-ranking sheriff's department officials to visit a crime scene, and even more so that Hellman stood vigil over the home on the first night and Hill took that duty on the second night. Perhaps, though, there was a reason. In addition to these charges, Sergeant David Hellman faced one all on his own. Hellman was indicted for allegedly aiding a burglar. That burglar just so happened to be Joe Cacciatore. It has since been alleged that Hellman and Hill were both directly involved with taking payments from Cacciatore, among others, for providing protection for their burglary operations. So, you've got a sheriff accused of corruption and two high-ranking members of his department who are not only overly involved in the investigation into Danny's abduction, but one of them has connections to Joe Cacciatore, who has been alleged to have been involved in the scheme to abduct Danny and possibly murder him. It seems quite clear that, if these accusations are true, it would be quite difficult to get a thorough investigation done when it's being overseen by those who have a reason to protect at least one of the individuals who may have been involved. I should note that all charges against these men were later dropped due to a Supreme Court ruling, though Hill and Hellman never returned to law enforcement jobs. Instead, Hellman became a bail bondsman and private investigator. Four years later, in 1970, Hellman was called to testify in a trial against another Dade County deputy accused of corruption, and Mr. Hellman refused to answer questions, pleading the Fifth Amendment 49 times. These connections, however, are sadly not where this story ends. According to Landry, the man in prison who spoke about the possibility of Cacciatore and Defias having been involved, Danny was murdered and taken to the ocean. The boat, Landry alleged, was named the Ponderosa and was owned by Wally Jefferson, 
a former Miami police officer operating as a bail bondsman at the time. Keep Mr. Jefferson's name in mind. According to Landry, he received all of this information in a conversation he had with a thief named John Newsom, as well as a former bootlegger and part-time Traficante associate, Charles Lloyd. Oh, also present was Charles' daughter, Sharon Lloyd. If that name sounds familiar, that would be because at the time of his abduction, Sharon Lloyd was dating Danny Goldman. For years, people wondered why the abductor believed there was money in the house. The Goldmans themselves thought it was a case of mistaken identity, but now it seems rather curious that an associate of Danny's girlfriend's father, who has ties to corrupt sheriff's deputies and burglaries, chose that house on that day. Interestingly, two years after Danny's abduction in June of 1968, Sharon, her father Charles, and Wally Jefferson were all arrested together outside of a courthouse. According to arrest records of the time, Jefferson was being arrested on an outstanding warrant and Sharon attempted to run over the deputy arresting him. The charges against Sharon were later dropped and Jefferson died two years later in 1970. Now, I asked you to keep Jefferson's name in mind. Remember, he was the one who owned the boat that was allegedly used to take Danny out to dump him in the ocean. What's even more interesting is on Wally Jefferson's official death certificate, Sharon Lloyd is listed as his wife. So Danny's former girlfriend married the man who allegedly owned the boat from which his body was disposed. How many tangled tendrils does this case have? It's not over yet. It took four years for investigators to follow up on Landry's initial report about the murder. When they finally did in 1972, they managed to track down and speak with John Newsom, the thief who had allegedly been present when Charles, Sharon, and Wally discussed the murder. Newsom, during his interview, confirmed the story and reported that Charles Lloyd had directly stated that Danny Goldman had been murdered and disposed of in the ocean by way of Wally Jefferson's boat. Unfortunately, by the time this interview was conducted, both Charles Lloyd and Wally Jefferson were dead. Newsom also confirmed that Joe Cacciatore had been involved in the initial abduction scheme. Newsom died two years later, in 1974. According to all records, Joe Cacciatore, who was known to police as a burglar operating in the area at that time, was never questioned. The next tale in this case comes in 12 years later, in 1986, when a woman told a disturbing story to a bartender in Miami. According to the woman who did not identify herself, Danny Goldman had been murdered by a bail bondsman. The woman went on to explain that Danny had recognized one of his abductors and so he had to be murdered to keep him quiet. She stated that Danny was then taken onto a boat and dropped into the ocean. While the woman did not identify herself, she did allege that at the time of the abduction, she was Danny Goldman's girlfriend, which would indicate that the woman was either Sharon Lloyd or someone pretending to be Sharon Lloyd. This information, given to the Surfside Police Department by the bartender, is in the official record and was followed up on, though nothing was ever found to prove it had actually happened. Sharon Lloyd, later Sharon Jefferson and currently Sharon Ramos, has spoken with authorities over the years. Sharon claims to have no knowledge of what happened to Danny and denies that her father, or for that matter anyone she knew, would have been involved in a crime like that. While Sharon has spoken to investigators, she's rather reserved when speaking with anyone else. She has spoken to reporters, though says she can't talk long due to age and illness. When asked about the 1986 bar incident, she denies having ever gone to a bar in Miami and spoken about Danny or any other details of the case. Sharon later stated, quote, I knew that the case was reopened. I don't know anything. End quote. The volunteers, including Novak, who have dug into this case as thoroughly as they have, would very much like to speak with Sharon, but she hasn't returned their inquiries. The group of volunteers headed by Novak have compiled quite the extensive case, with ties to not only Danny's abduction, but several other murders and notable names. They've also worked hard to keep Danny's name alive, finally getting him added into the system and officially listed as a missing person. Several years back, just before she died, 
The group were able to acquire DNA from one of Danny's aunts, on the off chance that, if ever found, he might be identified. I can't possibly go as deep as this group has, and I will link to their website where they have a fantastic archive of articles, images, and further information. Their website links to old newspaper articles were highly valuable to me during the writing of this episode. The abduction of Danny Goldman is a complicated network of corruption, lies, kickbacks, and truly paints a picture of the incredible grip organized crime had on law enforcement during the 1950s and 60s. While much of the information discussed here has to be listed as speculation, purely due to the fact that this case has never been properly investigated and half of the people who were in charge of investigating it appear to have ties to suspects who may have taken part in the crime. Less than one month ago, in March of 2019, we passed 53 years since Danny Goldman was taken. His parents, friends, classmates, and family all lived on never knowing the truth. Danny's story was a ghost story to many, something that haunted the neighborhood but didn't quite feel like it was real. As the story faded from the headlines, hope for answers dwindled. In the absence of an answer, several theories have been suggested. The first theory suggests that the abduction of Danny Goldman was, ultimately, a lie. Some believe that Danny was in fact ushered out of the country in order to avoid the draft, and that the Goldman family fabricated the abduction story in order to keep their son safe. This is a theory which has been bandied about since nearly the first days of the investigation. The second theory is what Aaron Goldman initially considered, that Danny's abduction was somehow connected to his business dealings, perhaps an angry ex-employee or rival in the construction business, but ultimately someone who wanted to hurt him and extort him. The third and final theory is that which has been comprised by Paul Novak and the Surfside Volunteers who have so thoroughly investigated this case. That Danny's abduction was connected to a scheme, possibly organized by his own girlfriend and or her father, to extort money, and when things didn't go right, Danny was ultimately murdered and disposed of while those involved in the crime were protected by corrupt officials and law enforcement officers. When Daniel Jess Goldman was last seen, he was described as being a Caucasian male with brown hair and brown eyes. He answers to the name Danny. When he was taken from his home on March 28, 1966, Danny was wearing a light tan windbreaker, size 4042, green corduroy pants, size 3436, and a plain yellow gold ring on his left hand inscribed with the initials DG. Danny's shirt size is listed as 15 and a half, and his shoe size is 9 wide. Danny has a dime-sized vaccination scar on his upper left arm, a 3-inch moon-shaped scar on his right ankle, and a 2-inch scar on the right side of his lower back. Danny was last seen in the 1100 block of 88th Street in Surfside, Florida. If alive today, Danny would be 71 years old, and age-progressed photos of him are available. The abduction of Danny Goldman is a case that almost no one talks about, primarily because no one knows about it. It's bizarre in that there's not a great deal of cases that fit this mold. An in-person abduction, at gunpoint, with a ransom demand that never comes and a victim who has never recovered. It's incredibly disturbing and frustrating. Aaron and Sally would have happily paid any sum to get their son back, but were never given the opportunity. Eventually, the couple withdrew, feeling that they had been betrayed by both law enforcement and the media. They tried to start a family again, and Sally became pregnant a few years later, but suffered her third miscarriage. Aaron and Sally both passed away in the last ten years, having never known what became of Danny, having never been given the opportunity to bury him and to have a place to truly mourn him by the tenets of their religion. But most of all, the Goldmans were robbed of Danny's future. Danny would have been 62 years old by the time his father passed away in 2010. What life could he have led? A husband, a father, perhaps even a grandfather? That answer can never be known, but perhaps justice can still be found all these years later, if this tangled web can finally be unraveled. Well. This is an insane case, isn't it? A 17-year-old with his whole life ahead of him gets abducted at gunpoint and is never seen again. 
1966, this was front page news, but in the years that followed, it seemed to get swept aside. Left in the wake of this incident were Danny's parents, Aaron and Sally, who didn't know what to do or how to fix it. They thought the abductor would call, and he didn't. Aaron, in interviews months after the abduction, seemed to blame himself. He said that if he had it all to do over again, he'd have fought against the assailant, knowing that he might have been killed, but that that would have been a better choice in his mind than letting his son get taken. I can't begin to imagine the guilt Aaron must have put on himself, or the pain he and Sally suffered through. In the years that have passed, a lot of questions have been asked and few answers have been supplied. Unfortunately, almost everyone who is alleged to have been tied to Danny's abduction has passed away. The suspects are gone, the investigators are gone. One person who may have answers, Sharon, remains, but argues that she has no idea what could have happened. Whether or not you believe her all depends on what side of the fence you're standing on, whose words you choose to believe. Informants, bartenders, former investigators, current investigators. There's a lot of different opinions here, though some of them have a rapidly growing pile of evidence supporting them. We don't know for certain what exactly occurred, and due to the hole that leaves, three theories have been commonly purported to try and fill in the blanks. The first of these theories targets the Goldmans themselves, and alleges that the entire situation was a lie. The basis for this entire theory is on the argument that the Goldmans didn't want their son to be drafted into Vietnam. With the changes to the draft in 1965, getting drafted would have been a possibility. We know that Danny was described as an average student, so whether or not his GPA would have been high enough to avoid being drafted is uncertain. This was, though, a time of a lot of strife in the country, and protests against Vietnam were expanding. You saw college students in the streets burning their draft cards, and the idea of getting out of the country to dodge the draft was certainly something that people were doing. We know that the Goldmans had money available to them to pull this off, and that others were successful in leaving the country in order to avoid the draft. Many people at the time believed this to be a possibility, though whether that was due to the sheer fact that the Goldmans had money, was an attempt to stir up suspicion against the parents, or just a general consideration, we truly don't know. But when you examine this theory, it doesn't take a great deal of time for it to fall apart in your hands. I honestly didn't even want to address it, but I knew if I didn't, someone would ask me why I had bypassed it. First and foremost, Danny was a senior in high school. He wasn't going to get drafted the day he registered, he'd still have to finish out high school. It wouldn't make a great deal of sense to send him away months before his graduation when, during that time, he was under no real risk of being drafted. Most people who attempted to dodge the draft did so after they had been drafted. There's no need to attempt to dodge something that might not apply to you. There was no way of knowing whether or not Danny would have been drafted, but logic would dictate that only when you get to that bridge would you choose to cross it. But this isn't the only problem with this theory. If you were trying to secretly help your son escape the country in order to avoid the draft, wouldn't you maybe pay a little bit more attention to the secret part of that? The Goldmans could have sent Danny out of the country and not told anyone he was gone for days. Why go through the effort of concocting some wild scheme involving an armed abductor when you know it's going to grab the attention of the media and the police. If what you're really trying to do is help your son escape, you probably don't want to draw this kind of attention. It seems counterintuitive. Not to mention, had this been the case, the Goldmans would have had to have had assistance. Somebody would need to tie them up. Someone would need to drive Danny's car to the location it was later found. Sally and Aaron would have had to have been tremendous actors considering all the media they dealt with not to mention investigators and the questions of friends and family members. Ultimately, this story spins out of a small possibility, and that is that the Goldmans may have been building up some cash in case they needed to get Danny out of the country. That certainly seems like a more believable proposition than actually doing it and trying to cover it up with a fake crime. I could certainly see them building a failsafe. However, while this may have been a fallback plan in a worst-case scenario to get Danny elsewhere, it doesn't make sense in terms of the way it's presented, not to mention it's been 53 years and no one has ever seen Danny again. Plenty of draft dodgers came back into the United States after the war. On January 21st, 1977, Jimmy Carter was officially sworn in as President of the United States. Honoring a promise he made during his campaign, 
He granted an unconditional pardon to hundreds of thousands of American men who fled the country in order to avoid the draft. The only people who weren't eligible were those who had been in the military and deserted, and those who had been arrested for violent acts during protests. Danny would have been free to return any time after that. Unless, of course, he was part of a fake crime, false police reports, and what would be described as fraud. But even then, if the family could sell this story, they could surely sell a story about him escaping from his captors and coming home. The draft dodging theory is simply broken. It doesn't make any sense, it doesn't seem to have any basis in reality, and the only piece of it which is generally considered a possibility is that there may have been a discussion about gathering up money to get Danny out of the country should that become necessary. Many people believe it's the details about this money that ultimately led the abductor to entering their home, believing he would find cash there. But this is an angle we'll get into in the final theory. Oh, there is one more detail which makes this theory highly unlikely, and that's the fact that George DeFias' fingerprint was recovered from the home sliding glass door on the morning of the abduction. The second theory is one which was initially put forth by Aaron Goldman himself. Goldman worked in real estate and construction and made a great deal of money for himself. As many are aware, successful business persons often step on others along the way, rub people the wrong way, or take shortcuts which could put others at risk. While we don't know any specific details about how Aaron conducted his business, it does seem a bit naive to assume that he never did anything to upset a competitor or an employee. People get fired, bids for jobs have politics involved with greasing the wheels for the decision makers, and lucrative projects become major sources of contention. It's extremely possible that Aaron had made some enemies along the way. Business can be very cutthroat, and if someone felt wronged enough by Aaron, it isn't difficult to imagine they'd want to take revenge. The idea of breaking into his home and attempting to extort $10,000 isn't outside the realm of possibility. It becomes a question of who may have been pulling the strings, as it certainly seems unlikely that the rival himself would have done it. He'd probably have hired someone, and as is common knowledge, the construction and real estate businesses have had ties to organized crime since nearly the inception of the Mafia. The idea that a business rival in southern Florida wouldn't have reached out to someone in organized crime to help strike against Aaron is pretty small. Perhaps this is where we enter into the world of low-level criminals operating under the umbrella of Santo Tropicante. Criminals who, through their mafia connections, have cut deals with corrupt officials and law enforcement officers who are happy to look the other way for a cut of the profits. Of course, covering up a robbery is very different from covering up an abduction and a murder, not to mention the abduction of a member of a prominent wealthy family. I've often wondered if the choice to take Danny was premeditated or spur of the moment. Was it really a response to there simply not being any money in the house, or was that the goal from the start? That we may never know. So sure, it's absolutely possible that a business rival, ex-employee, or someone who felt wronged by Aaron would have struck back against him. Getting $10,000 out of him would have been a nice bonus on top of teaching him a lesson, but everything seemed to go sideways when Danny was taken. That changed this crime from that of extortion and armed robbery to abduction and possibly murder. That's a different animal, and when someone who has hired a few low-level crooks to scare a rival, well, he might have really lost his spine when he realized what they'd done. Perhaps then the choice was easy for the conspirators. Take the risk of extorting the money, knowing that any money they requested would be marked, any location they dictated would be surveilled, or eliminate Danny and free themselves from the possibility of being caught. Sure, they'd lose the money, but they'd keep their freedom, and this would hardly be the first time a group of criminals opted to murder rather than face arrest. The only major problem with this theory is that, in 53 years, there's really never been anything revealed to make the connections. No one has ever been able to determine a business rival who wanted to punish Aaron to this severe of a line. There were no whispers of anyone being involved that may have previously had business dealings with Aaron, at least not above the table. One thing which has to again be considered is that, working in construction and real estate, Aaron would almost definitely have come into contact with or been made aware of members of organized crime who worked in the area and leaned on local businesses for protection money, kickbacks, and all manner of other extortion. It's highly unlikely Aaron hadn't bumped into some of these people along the way. Perhaps that could explain why the abductor called them by their first names and acted as though he knew them.
all of the Mafia connections really tend to lead away from this theory and into the third and final theory. Due to the hard work of Paul Novak and the Surfside Volunteers, a great wealth of information has been uncovered. This information paints a dark story of lies, corruption, kickbacks, murder, and cover-ups. All of these details point to a select group of people who are believed to have been involved, in some way, shape, or form, with Danny's abduction, and what has been speculated to have been his murder. Before digging right into this theory, I just want to lay out the names involved and their connections to Danny, as well as each other. The man whose fingerprint was found in the home is George Defias. Defias operated in burglary and robbery, though it's believed he was also responsible for several murders, so this is not exactly a guy who would have shied away from trying to rob a family, and if things went bad, taking and possibly even murdering their son. Defias knows Joe Cacciatore. Both men are associates of the Traficante crime family. Joe is Traficante's first cousin, and Defias is married to a woman named Shirley Cacciatore, which seems a bit much to just be a coincidence. Cacciatore is later connected to Sergeant David Hellman of the Dade County Sheriff's Department when it's alleged that Hellman has been taking payments from Cacciatore to protect his burglary operation, and that Hellman himself may have been directly involved with some of those burglaries. Hellman, at the time, was the head of the intelligence division of the Sheriff's Department. Major Manson Hill was the chief of detectives for the Dade County Sheriff's Department and was also indicted on charges related to larceny and burglary. While these charges were later dropped due to a Supreme Court ruling, it certainly seems there was something strange going on with the Sheriff's Department. Three others besides Hellman and Hill were also indicted for the same charges. The Sheriff himself was indicted for perjury and attempted bribery in connection to these charges. I know we've seen corrupt cops in the past, but this is an entirely corrupt department. So you have two burglars, one of whom may have also been a killer, who were connected to and protected by at least one deputy of the sheriff's department that is investigating Danny's case. The question becomes why the Goldmans became targets in the first place. It isn't as though they weren't already known in the community, and as I've established, it's also highly unlikely Aaron hadn't at some point dealt with members of organized crime in the area. That leads us to Charles Lloyd, his daughter Sharon, and her future husband Wally Jefferson. Sharon is around Danny and his family. She has inside knowledge of the house, its layout, and probably some idea of the family's financial situation. Were Danny to have made a comment to her, or were she to have overheard, anything in relation to money and the draft, it's not a large leap in logic to imagine she could have mentioned that the family was storing $10,000 in the house. Were Sharon to mention this to her father, she'd be telling a former bootlegger with connections to the Traficante crime family. Wally Jefferson, a former Miami police officer and at the time a bail bondsman, was obviously close with the Lloyd family, being friends with Charles and later the husband of Sharon, who was 23 years his junior. He could have easily been brought into this scheme. He'd have connections to law enforcement, which he might be able to utilize, but he'd also have connections to criminals he'd established relationship with as a bail bondsman, not to mention as a former police officer. So breaking it all down, two criminals connected to Traficante operate as burglars. Two sheriff's deputies are connected to charges related to protecting at least one of those burglars' operations, and the sheriff himself is accused of lying under oath in relation to these charges. Danny's girlfriend is the daughter of a man who used to work for the mafia and has connections to the Traficante family, and his close friend and future son-in-law is a former cop who has connections through his bail bonds operation to criminals, as well as apparently a boat named the Ponderosa. It seems pretty clear what went down here, but I do have one question. Was this a matter of Charles Lloyd becoming aware that the Goldmans may have been storing money in their home, and so he passed this word along, hoping for a cut of the profits? Or is it possible that the Traficante family was already targeting Goldman? Remember, Aaron had been involved with the FBI in relation to a racketeering and conspiracy case related to two of the banks he had sat on the boards of. Indictments rolled out and the operation was damaged which certainly lightened the pockets of multiple high-level Mafia family members who may have wanted revenge. So, is it possible that Traficante or someone in his organization got the word out that they wanted revenge against Aaron, and this just happened to reach the ears of Charles Lloyd through his criminal friends and former Mafia connections, who, at the time, just happened to be in possession of the knowledge that money may have been stored at the Goldman home by way of his daughter, or he later came across this information and offered it up as payback for the grand jury indictments, 
It's certainly a complicated web here, but you can sort of see the connections. We may not understand exactly how this came about, but all the factors seem to be in play with this theory. So, what you have to ask yourself is this. Is it possible that a lone burglar who has robbed many places before without abducting anyone, on a whim, made the choice to break into a home, hold a family at gunpoint, and request $10,000, believing so thoroughly that it was there that his first statement to the family was, you know why I'm here, and when it wasn't, decided to kidnap their 17-year-old son with the intent of making a ransom demand only to murder Danny later, or is it more likely that multiple individuals with ties to organized crime, corrupt law enforcement officials, and the father of Danny's girlfriend pooled their information together and came up with a scheme to rob or extort a large sum of money from a man who had already angered the head of a crime family that controlled South Florida? Oh, and perhaps taking Danny was part of the plan all along, to send a message to Aaron to keep his mouth shut in future investigations. There are tons of documents, court cases, and files related to this theory. The web is extensive, and expands into other crimes including other murders. It's difficult to really pull on every thread here because there are so many, and with them come other possibilities. But all in all, when weighed side by side, this theory seems to be one which carries the most weight. And so it seems the most probable that Danny's abduction and likely later murder was the result of a planned plot to rob Aaron Goldman and transmit a message to not keep cooperating with federal investigators who had filed 19 indictments related to illegal activities at at least two banks with ties to Meyer Lansky and Santo Traficante just four days before Danny was taken. You know, there's one detail that bothers me. We've heard multiple accounts that Danny was murdered because he recognized one of his abductors. Now, we don't know if that was part of the plan, to abduct Danny originally, but we also don't know who he recognized. Obviously, it wasn't Defias or Cacciatore, as he likely didn't hang around older criminals. But could it have been the father of his own girlfriend, in Cacciatore's apartment, some two and a half blocks from where his car was found, not expecting Danny to have been abducted in the first place? And when he gets identified, he gets scared. And then Sharon's future husband, Wally Jefferson, makes the suggestion of murder. The abduction of Danny Goldman is a sweeping story filled with all the details one would expect to find in a Hollywood gangster film, and yet it was a real-life incident that stole away the life of a young man who had no responsibility for any of the acts for which he may have been punished. It's hard to imagine, it's hard to wrap your head around the idea that this young man could have been dating a young woman who may have been responsible, in part, for his abduction, whether on purpose or by purely nonchalantly mentioning the possibility of money in his home to her father. Of course, if Rob Landry is correct, the man who first told the sheriff's deputy this story in 1968, if Sharon didn't know about the crime before it happened, she apparently knew about it after. Sharon went on to marry Wally Jefferson, who was indicated as the man who had owned the boat that was used to transport Danny's remains to the ocean where they were disposed of. And so Danny's ex-girlfriend may have married a man who helped murder him. Truth is often stranger than fiction. It's been 53 years and the answers have yet to be solidified. Paul Novak, when asked about it, acknowledged that it's unlikely all these years later that the case will be officially solved. But the possibility does remain that answers could be revealed. At least one person out there may have information, if only she'd choose to share it. A great deal of credit has to be given to Novak and his volunteers, without whom I don't think any of us would have had any knowledge of this terrible crime. It would have just faded away. But thanks to their efforts, Danny's name carries on, and the search for justice continues. Unless new information can be found and supported, someone confesses, or there is some other break in this case, the abduction of Danny Goldman remains open and unsolved, but it is warming up. If you're looking for more information about the abduction of Danny Goldman, there are a few forums discussing it, several old newspaper archives with available material, and I can't more highly recommend the website surfsidekidnapping.org, which is made and maintained by Paul Novak and the Volunteers, it has a great wealth of information, and I will link to it in the show notes. If you have any information about the abduction of Danny Goldman, 
please contact the FBI or the Miami-Dade Police Department at area code 305-471-2400. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. This year, CrimeCon will be held in New Orleans from June 7th through the 9th. Amidst exciting presentations and inspiring discussions, I'm really looking forward to attending and representing Trace Evidence on Podcast Row. If you're planning to attend but haven't yet purchased your pass, you can save 10% by using the promo code TRACE19. Simply visit CrimeCon.com, select a standard pass, and use the code TRACE19. That's T-R-A-C-E-1-9 to save 10% today. I look forward to seeing you there. A special shout-out goes to Patreon producers Alicia Lorraine, Krista Colvin, Diani Dyson, Eamon Brady, Kate Alexander, Chandra Moreau, Tara Doble, and Tom Archer. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence. Visit trace-evidence.com for all episodes, social media links, merchandise, and more. I want to thank you all for listening to this episode and remind you that if you're planning to attend CrimeCon in New Orleans, to use the promo code TRACE19 for 10% off a standard badge. I'll be on Podcast Row and can't wait to meet all of you. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.